And Bill, of course, insists that he doesn't want to have a long introduction, but of course, it never helps anyway. So uh, Bill Phillips is, of course, the well-known distinguished professor at the Joint Quantum Institute, which is a collaborative institution of the University of Maryland and the National Institute of Science and Technology, which was called the National Bureau of Standards before, which might be important at one point. After finishing his, his PhD thesis at MIT, Bill already joined the, at that point, National Bureau of Standards in, in 78. And shortly after that, um, he, of course, um, started an activity which is well known, which is the field of laser cooling uh, and the, the laser trapping of atoms, all the way to both Einstein condensates, uh, to ultra cold matter waves, and to quantum information with single atoms. And of course, as all of us know, um, this was culminating in an acknowledgement of his work by the Nobel Prize in Physics in 97, together with Steve Chu and uh, Claude Cointanucci for um, the development of methods to cool and trap atoms with laser light. But um, also being a driving force in the field of ultra cold atoms and quantum technology, I might say these days, um, Bill started actually out at NIST, which is the US standard institution and the place of continuous promotion of the SI system in the United States starting out work on what is now called the Kibble balance, the Watt balance. So his initial obligation in uh, at NIST was to develop um, a replacement of the unit of mass. And this legacy, of course, continues in the thoughts all along until today. And for that reason, um, Bill always stayed interested in the uh, evolution of the SI unit system. And for that reason, we are looking forward to this presentation you're gonna give us today on the new international system of units, how a metric system has experienced its greatest revolution since the French Revolution. So Bill, we are very happy that you could join us and we are very much looking forward to your presentation and I give the stage to you. Uh, thank you very much, Gerhard. Uh, so uh, uh, the new international system of units, um, as, you, uh, uh, as you know, I'm from the, uh, the Joint Quantum Institute, with, which is joint between both uh, NIST and the University of Maryland, but NIST being the uh, international or the national metrology laboratory of the, of the US, of which there are examples in many other countries, uh, that's the main uh, focus of, of this talk. And at NIST, I'm part of the laser cooling and trapping group, and my group leader, uh, Gretchen Campbell, has already given a talk in this, uh, in this meeting, and you've heard about her wonderful work with rings. Um, so I do want to emphasize uh, that this is not an, an atomtronics talk, although there are some things that may relate to atomtronics. Uh, this is what is often called an enrichment talk, one that is outside the field of the meeting, but nevertheless of general interest, because let's face it, science is about measurement, and uh, everyone needs to know about measurement. And so I'm bringing you uh, uh, some of the latest ideas about the way in which we measure things, which is with the international system of units. Now, NIST has been a leader in uh, these reforms of the international system of units, the modern metric system that I'm gonna be telling you about. The International Union of Pure and Applied Physics has also been a strong supporter of the uh, international system of units. And as a member of the commission that has to do with units, uh, I'm also doing this on behalf of IUPAP. <clears throat> so what is this, uh, this revolution that we're having that is, uh, according to my claim, uh, the greatest revolution since uh, uh, the French Revolution? Well, on the 20th of May, 2019, just um, uh, a little bit more than two years ago, we experienced uh, this, this great revolution and the nature of this revolution, I have no idea why that extra stuff is there, <laughs> but the nature of this revolution uh, <clears throat> is to try to have a final realization of what the French revolutionaries wanted, which was to make a system of units that would be good for all time and for all people. And uh, the, the, the revolution changes the definitions of a number of the base units of the metric system, of the base units being the kilogram, the meter, the second, the ampere, the Kelvin, the mole, and the candela, changes those definitions so that today, every one of those base units is defined 
by fixing a value of some constant of nature. Now, in order to understand how it is possible that we can define a unit of the metric system by defining a constant of nature. And with apologies to the late great Stephen Hawking, I would like to bring you a short history of length. The original approach to measuring length was to use the human body as a standard. A, a foot was a foot. A, uh, uh, a fathom was the, uh, the arm span of, uh, uh, of a human being. Now, this was wonderful uh, because it was extremely convenient. You always had your standard of measurement with you. Uh, the trouble was that it was not very con consistent. Uh, if you bought fabric from a short fabric merchant, you might not get the amount of fabric that you had expected. Uh, and so one approach was to use uh, a particular body as the standard of measurement, uh, the body of the monarch, uh, or uh, in ancient Egypt, it was the, uh, the body of the pharaoh. The length of the pharaoh's uh, forearm uh, became the royal cubit. Now, the trouble was that this at least was consistent, but it was not convenient. Uh, so uh, the ancient Egyptians made an artifact, a stone uh, cubit that was the length of the pharaoh's uh, forearm. And it was used as the standard of length for uh, Egypt. Uh, people who were working in the field, uh, doing something like building the pyramids, used working standards made out of wood. Uh, and it was required that these working standards were calibrated every month uh, with the death penalty for the failure to calibrate. These people were really serious about metrology. And uh, the result of this seriousness was that they um, made the pyramids really, really well. Uh, the baselines of the pyramid are consistent to a small fraction of a percent. They're square to 12 arc seconds. These are really well made because of the seriousness of the metrology. And this idea of having an artifact uh, became common throughout the world uh, in Europe. Uh, there were similar artifacts, uh, often varying from one town to another, but fixed into um, the wall of the town square, for example. And here in the uh, town of Regensburg, you see uh, the standard fathom, which looks like it's a pretty long fathom. So maybe this was a good place uh, to buy fabric. But if you went into uh, some of the surrounding uh, towns of Bavaria, you would have a different standard of length. This variation of length standard was a common problem, but it was uh, really annoying. So uh, at the time of the French Revolution, the revolutionaries guided by this principle of universality decided they would redefine uh, the standard of length to be called the meter, and it would be something available to everyone because they would use something that was available to everyone, namely the earth on which we live. Uh, and they defined the meter to be one ten millionth of the distance uh, from the pole to the equator on a meridian, uh, just to make sure that everything was completely universal on a meridian that goes through Paris. Uh, so they sent out um, surveyors uh, to determine what that uh, length of the distance between uh, uh, Dunkirk and uh, Barcelona was, and then extrapolated to the, the full length of the meridian. And uh, uh, making those measurements in terms of some old system of units, they brought it back. And now, <clears throat> well, here you can see they were trying to realize this dream of something that would be good for all time for all people good for all people because it was on the earth and everyone had access to the earth, although perhaps not so easily. Good for all time because they didn't recognize the possibility that the earth might change. Uh, and then you see this mythological creature actually measuring the earth. They did that by surveying and uh, uh, found that um, just as in the case of the Pharaoh's forearm, uh, this might've been consistent but not very convenient. And so they did just what the ancient Egyptians did. They made an artifact. And here is a picture of the meter of the archives deposited in the archives of France uh, at, uh, in 1799. 
And uh, that became the standard of length, the meter for the country of France. Uh, some decades later, at the time of the famous International Convention de Maître, the international meeting at which the world adopted the metric system for its standard of length, they made a new meter based on the old one. And uh, this uh, meter was uh, the distance between two scratches on a platinum meridian bar instead of the distance between the ends of this uh, uh, platinum bar uh, in the archives. Uh, it's hard to have an end standard because if you uh, use it, you have to touch it and touching it can wear it down. And so uh, they made this, uh, these very fine scratches in this, uh, in this meter bar. And that became the international prototype of the meter, a, uh, a system of measurement that recalls just what the ancient Egyptians did with their stone um, uh, cubit. Almost as soon as they created this new standard of, of measurement in the late 19th century, uh, it became obsolete uh, because uh, you had much better ways of measuring things. For example, uh, during the 19th century, physicists had discovered that uh, light was a wave and they made interferometers. Here we see a cartoon of a Michelson interferometer. And as you well know, if you move this mirror by one quarter of a wavelength of light, just uh, a couple of hundred nanometers, you change this interference pattern from having a dark spot at the center to having a light spot at the center. And uh, uh, that uh, a quarter of a wavelength of light uh, is much finer than what you can determine the position of a scratch on a piece of metal. Uh, and of course, you could do it to a fraction of that because uh, you can interpolate between the dark and, uh, and, and light centers quite easily. And so you had a way of measuring length that was far better than the very definition of length itself. So people began to use the wavelength of light as a sort of de facto standard. It was not the official standard of length, but it was much easier uh, to make high precision measurements of length using light uh, as a de facto standard. And that continued for many decades until finally in 1960, the year the laser was invented, the international community redefined the meter to be a certain number of wavelengths of light from a krypton lamp shown here. But almost as soon as that new definition came into effect, people realized that the purity of light coming from this lamp was insufficient for the accuracy of measurements that people were already making with laser light. And so just as in the case of the 19th century metrologists, 20th century metrologists began to use laser light as a de facto length standard. Here's a picture of a helium neon laser that is stabilized to a transition in molecular iodine. And this became the de facto standard of length throughout the world uh, in the latter part of the 20th century. <clears throat> and so it became clear to everyone that just as before, when uh, Krypton was, uh, uh, was made the standard uh, to replace the international prototype of the kilogram, that we needed again to redefine the meter because you had a new technology that was better than the old definition. The obvious thing to do would have been to redefine the meter in terms of the uh, wavelength of an iodine stabilized helium neon laser. Fortunately, people did not make the obvious choice. They made instead what I think of as being a beautiful and brilliant choice. They defined the speed of light. The new definition of the meter was and is today that the meter is the length of path traveled by light during a certain time interval. Setting that time interval sets what the speed of light is. And given this universal expression that the um, wavelength times the frequency of the light is equal to the speed of light, if you know the frequency of the light, and if you define the speed of light, which this definition does, then that means you know its wavelength, regardless of what the light is. Now, I mentioned that this definition required that 
there be a way of measuring optical frequencies. And that's why this redefinition was possible because the measurement of optical frequencies became possible. But the beauty of this is that if someone makes a better laser, and they did, and if someone devises a better way of measuring the frequency of light, and they did, then this definition still holds. This definition can still be used to uh, define what you mean by a, uh, uh, a meter. Uh, and so I wanna emphasize what happened here. We began with a meter uh, that was an artifact, a way of doing things that goes back at least to ancient Egypt. It was defined, redefined in terms of a constant of nature, the wavelength of light coming from a discharge lamp of krypton gas. And when that wasn't good enough, it was redefined in terms of a fundamental and universal constant of nature, the speed of light. Now, <clears throat> the beauty of this is that we should never need to change this definition again. And now we're going to use that beautiful and brilliant approach to redefine what we mean by a kilogram and for that matter, what we mean by an ampere, a kelvin, and a mole. The, this is the revolution that I'm talking about. The fact that four new units of the international system of units have been redefined in this beautiful and brilliant way. Why was this necessary and how was it done? Well, in order to tell you that, I'd like to now bring you a light history of mass. In the ancient world, it was just like length. There were artifacts. This is a set of uh, stones used in ancient Babylonia uh, as the standard of mass. And uh, this worked very well, but it had the same kind of problem that we've seen with the artifact standards of length. It was not universal. And so at the time of the French Revolution, the revolutionaries taking this same uh, approach of wanting to have something that was universal and available to everyone, uh, redefined the kilogram to be the mass of one cubic decimeter of water. <clears throat> this is wonderful. You had the universal meter, you had water, something that's easily available, uh, and you use that to define the kilogram. But it turned out not to be so easy. It's not that easy to get exactly a liter of water. Uh, it's not that easy to determine uh, the mass of a liter of water because the density depends on temperature and uh, water wets things and there are all sorts of difficulties. And so they did what the ancient Egyptians did. Once again, they made an artifact. This is a picture of me holding the kilogram of the archives, uh, a platinum cylinder that was deposited in the archives of France in 1799, whose mass was as close as it was possible to make it to the mass of a kilogram, of, uh, that is uh, to the mass of a liter of water. And this became the mass standard for France. A few decades later at the Convention de Maitre, they made or they, they agreed that they would make, uh, it was made a few years later, a new artifact that became known as the international prototype of the kilogram, a platinum iridium cylinder that was based upon the mass of the kilogram of the archives. This was, until two years ago, the standard of mass for the entire world, the international prototype of the kilogram. It was the last artifact. Here's a picture of me with it uh, next to Rich Davis, the keeper of the, uh, the kilogram uh, at the International Bureau of Weights and Measures. <clears throat> so I want you to think about this. We are now in the beginning of the 21st century. The unit of mass was an artifact, a piece of metal made in the 19th century based on an object made in the 18th century. This is scandalous. If you were to leave a fingerprint on the international prototype of the kilogram, everyone in the world would lose weight and not in a way that helps your health at all. 
what can we do to fix this scandal? Well, no one uh, does leave finger fingerprints, but nevertheless, the mass of the international prototype of the kilogram is changing. Here is a plot of the mass of copies identical copies of the international prototype of the kilogram, all made at the same time over a century. And as you can see, almost all of those copies are changing and they're changing in the same direction. It doesn't take too much imagination to believe that it may in fact be the international prototype of the kilogram that is changing or that they're all changing since all of the the copies are changing in the same direction, you might think the kilogram itself is changing, but it cannot because by definition, the international prototype of the kilogram is always a kilogram. That's a scandal. We cannot have that and we must fix that problem. And we want to fix it in the same way that we fix the problem of the meter. Namely, we want to fix it by defining a fundamental constant of nature. For the meter, we defined the speed of light. What shall we use for the kilogram? Well, in order to motivate that, let me remind you of what is surely the most famous equation in history, uh, E equals mc squared. The energy of an object at, at rest is equal to its rest mass times the square of the speed of light. Now there's another equation that you're all familiar with. It isn't quite as famous. The energy of a photon, is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the light. Now, now let us just blindly combine these two equations and solve for the mass. <clears throat> what we find is that if we have an object that emits a photon of frequency f, its mass will change by an amount that is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of that photon divided by the speed of light squared. Now we've already defined the speed of light <clears throat> to define the meter. We know how to measure the frequency of photons. If we define the Planck constant, that means we have a way of measuring mass. Now we are not actually going to weigh photons. We could in fact weigh photons. People do in fact weigh photons, but not well enough. <clears throat> Instead, we're going to define Planck's constant and use an electromechanical device invented by this fellow, Brian Kibble. <clears throat> this device is called the Kibble balance or the Watt balance. And this movie uh, shows how it works. So first I want to invite you to remember how you weigh things normally. If you have an unknown mass over here on this side of a balance and you want to know what its mass is, you take known masses and put them on the other side of the balance. And when the known masses balance the unknown mass, then you have weighed that unknown mass. Everyone has done this. We've been doing this for centuries. Now I want to invite you to imagine a different way of doing it. Let's imagine that instead of having masses on the other side, we have a coil of wire. And that coil of wire has a current going in it. And that coil of wire is immersed in a magnetic field represented by these red lines of magnetic field. And if you can measure the current in this coil, and if you can measure where that current goes in all the wires of that coil, and if you can measure the magnetic field and the direction in which the magnetic field goes, you could calculate what the force is created by this uh, uh, electromagnetic device and balance that force against the gravitational force of, uh, uh, of your unknown mass. And then using the local acceleration of gravity, which you do by uh, using one of uh, uh, Philippe's uh, devices to measure the acceleration of gravity, then you've measured the mass. <clears throat> the problem is that all those things that I said you needed to do, you can't do except for measuring the acceleration of gravity. You can't measure the current. You can't know what the magnetic field is and what direction it's pointing in. And here's where the genius of Kibble comes in. Kibble said, fine, let's imagine a different kind of experiment than the one that you're seeing here, or an additional experiment, I should say, to the one you see here. You take that coil of wire, <clears throat> and instead of putting current through it, you attach the leads of that coil to a voltmeter. 
Now, if you move the coil of wire in this magnetic field, it will generate a voltage. And if you measure that voltage, and at the same time you measure the velocity of the coil, then it turns out that you will get all the information that you need in order to make this experiment work. <clears throat> this is just like a generator. And then uh, uh, you, you then need the other part of the experiment that I already showed where you measure the force, okay? Now you combine the two parts of the experiment. The, uh, the mass times the gravity is the force you measure in what we call the weighing part, the part that I showed you first. You multiply that by the velocity from the uh, velocity part of the experiment, the second part of the experiment. And that has to be equal to the current that you measured in the first part of the experiment, the weighing mode, times the voltage generated in the second part of the experiment. Why? Because this is mechanical power and this is electrical power. It's as if you had made a perfect motor generator, but it's perfect because you did it in two different parts. You did the, the weighing, so you were doing the motor part without moving anything. And in the velocity mode, you measured the voltage doing the generator part without drawing any power. So there was no dissipation in either case. And, in the, and you end up with a perfect uh, equality between mechanical power and electrical power measured virtually. So then, of course, you just solve for the mass. And this tells you what the mass is. It's the current times the voltage divided by the acceleration of gravity times the velocity. But wait, you say. You promised that this was going to be involving Planck's constant. Where does Planck's constant come in? And Planck's constant comes in because the way in which we're going to measure the current and the voltage are the quantum ways using the von Klitzing effect, the quantum Hall effect, and the Josephson effect. So here I am with Brian Josephson and uh, Klaus von Klitzing. Brian Josephson taught us we could measure voltage by using this constant, 2e over h, uh, in hertz per volt. And uh, Klaus von Klitzing taught us that a particular arrangement in a 2D uh, uh, electron gas would give a, 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 a cross resistance, a ratio between voltage and current that is in units of h over e squared in ohms. And when we see that we measure the voltage in units of 2e over h, so that is proportional to h over 2e, and we measure the current by measuring the voltage across some resistor using uh, the, the von Klitzing constant of h over e squared, we find that the current is proportional to the charge on the electron. When we multiply that by the voltage, inversely proportional to the charge on the electron, the uh, mass is proportional to uh, to Planck's constant. I realize that was sort of quick, and of course you should never do algebra in public, but if you wanna ask me about it, uh, I'll be happy to talk about it later. Here is a photograph of such a kibble balance at NIST. Balances like this around the world can measure the kilogram to a part in 10 to the eighth, which is better than the changes that are occurring to the kilogram because of whatever we don't really know, but I'm just gonna call it dirt. Something happens to these kilograms that change their mass. And now we don't have to put up with that anymore. Now, one of the beauties of redefining the kilogram in this way is that we don't have to do it using a kibble balance. We can do it in another way we can do something that is very much in the spirit of this conference. Uh, using an atom interferometer, we can measure the recoil of uh, atoms when they absorb a photon. And that recoil velocity is given by Planck's constant divided by the mass of the atom and the wavelength of the light. So we can solve for the mass and we find that if we measure this recoil velocity, which our atom interferometers do very well, uh, then, knowing the wavelength of the light, which is something we know very well, we can get the mass of the atom in kilograms, not in atomic mass units. And then we use uh, uh, trapped ions to measure the ratio of masses, and we find the mass of 
uh, silicon atoms, for example, in terms of these atoms, which are typically going to be rubidium, and make a perfect sphere out of a perfect crystal of silicon. And then this sphere is manufactured so that it is the most spherical object ever made on, on the face of the earth. You measure its dimensions. You measure its lattice constant of this perfect crystal, and that means you have essentially counted how many atoms there are, and you know what the mass in kilograms is of each atom, so you know what the mass of this object is because you defined Planck's constant. And now all over the world, people have measured uh, either with uh, the Kibble balance or with the, uh, the silicon sphere, people have measured uh, first Planck's constant, because before you define Planck's constant, doing these experiments is a measurement of Planck's constant. When these measurements all over the world agreed to uh, the necessary precision, then it was time to turn the experiments around, define Planck's constant, and use this as the way of measuring a kilogram. And so when that was accomplished, when all of these um, uh, experiments agreed to a sufficiently uh, a good amount. Uh, uh, the General Conference of Weights and Measures met in Versailles in uh, November of 2018 and voted unanimously 60 countries who are all signers of the International Treaty of the Meter voted unanimously to make this change. And this was the movie that was shown after that unanimous vote. It took more than 140 years. Groundbreaking science. And the agreement from the world's scientific community. At times, it seemed impossible. Accurate. Precise measurements. Anytime. Anywhere. But we, we did, did it. it. Ce l'abbiamo fatta. We have no special. Lolo, no, no, grams. Lei si è buoni. One and two. Lisbon and I love them. Proud to die. Lisbon is just a little. It is on the food. It is dear. 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 It is Congratulations. Well, I still get emotional when I see that. To think that 60 countries from all over the world could unanimously agree on anything makes me hopeful that perhaps we will find other things and other ways of agreeing on other, on other things. Well, there's a final part of the story. I wish I had enough time to talk in more detail about this, but the ampere uh, has been changed. You have 10 minutes. Yeah, but we want time for questions, of course. <laughs> And there's still more. <laughs> the ampere has been changed. You may remember, and you may have even taught your students that the ampere is that current, which when put into two long straight wires, one meter apart, will produce a force of two times 10 to the minus seven newtons per meter. That is no longer true. That definition made the uh, magnetic permeability of the vacuum equal to four pi times 10 to the minus seven newton per ampere squared. That is no longer true as well. So if you've been telling your students that, you have been lying. The ampere is now defined by defining the charge on the electron. And because an ampere is a coulomb per second, once you've defined the charge of the electron in coulombs, you have said how many electrons it takes per second to make an ampere. And that is the new definition of the ampere. Because we now have the electron charge defined. And we have Planck's constant, <clears throat> excuse me, defined because of the, the definition of the kilogram. That means that Josephson's constant, 2e over h, and the von Klitzing constant, h over e squared, are both exact. And we can now make 
any kind of electrical measurements based on the Josephson effect and the quantum Hall effect in the international system of units using exact definitions. So this is beautiful. <clears throat> Besides that, the mole has been redefined. It used to be that the mole was the amount of substance that had a number of entities equal to the number of carbon-12 atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12. That is no longer the case. Today, we have defined Avogadro's number. And a mole is simply a number of entities, a defined number of entities. And finally, the Kelvin. It used to be that the Kelvin was 1 over 273.16 of the triple point of water. Now, we define the Kelvin by defining Boltzmann's constant. And I really love this because it makes temperature microscopic. It makes temperature this, this uh, atomic level phenomenon as we've understood it to be since the late 19th century, since people like Boltzmann and Kelvin taught us that temperature was about molecular motion. Now that idea is enshrined in the very definition of what we mean by a Kelvin. So we really have a very atomic, a very quantum way of thinking about temperature, about the mole, about amount of substance, about current, about, um, about mass. And so the French Revolution brought us the metric system. The international agreement uh, uh, came uh, a few decades later with the Convention de Metro that had the entire world agreeing that we were going to use this metric system with length in meters and uh, mass in kilograms. And of course, time in seconds, which I didn't even talk about, but uh, that is of course a wonderful history in itself. And so two years ago on the 20th of May, which is by the way, the anniversary of the signing of the Convention de Metra and is celebrated as I'm sure you all know, internationally as World Metrology Day, we had this wonderful revolution, the biggest revolution since the French Revolution. And that revolution has given us a, a metric system in which the base units are defined by fixing the values of constants of nature. So it appears that we have in fact finally realized the dream of those revolutionaries who wanted to have a system of units that was good for all time and for all people, but they failed because they found that in order to make their system work, they needed to make artifacts. And those artifacts are by definition not available to all people. And those artifacts, as we've seen in the case of the kilogram, are not even stable in time. And so we have replaced those artifacts with something much closer to the original dream of the, of the French revolutionaries by having our uh, standards based on constants of nature. And so it seems we have finally done uh, the dream of having something à tous les temps, à tous les peuples, except for time itself. And the reason is that time is tied to a specific atom, cesium. The second is that number of cycles that you see right there of the frequency corresponding to the hyperfine transition in cesium. And the trouble is that today we have other atoms with optical transitions that are able to realize uh, time two orders of magnitude better than you can do with cesium. And so, as for the future of time, only time will tell, but we've come to the end of this talk, but you know, it's not really the end because we still have to redefine the SI second. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill, from our side for this fascinating tour through the definition of the SI units from artifacts to atoms and the, the open questions still ahead of us. And I see Luigi who raised his hand as the first person. Yes, uh, thanks for the beautiful talk. I'm very, very excited. Say, uh, I have um, one, uh, say, actually, I understand all the um, units are related to constant of nature, right? So, yes. but uh, what if, if the constant of nature are not constant? Aha, say, okay. 
Wonderful. The, this okay. Is the, this is the, don't, I, let me say, or let me complete. Say, um, would be better to measure the things or to provide the, uh, these units in terms of operation, Chais, like uh, the uh, operation, how it's called, it's operationism, I think. No? So you define something in terms of the operation you do. Okay, well, so, so this, of course, was the matter of a, a, a great deal of debate as to just how the definition should be. But let me address this issue about whether the constants of nature are constant. Let us imagine, for example, that our definition of length is improper because the speed of light changes. What I will tell you is the speed of light cannot change. It is illegal for the speed of light to change because we have set what the speed of light is in law. It is not a matter of... Uh, because the speed of light has units of meters per second, and because we get to decide what a meter is and what a second is, these are not something that are natural. These are human constructs. What is a meter and what is a second? Because we get to construct by our choice what a meter and what a second is, that means that we can fix the speed of light, and that is what we've done. I would claim that it is meaningless to imagine that over time, the speed of light changes. <clears throat> now, let me, I realize that's a rather radical statement. Lots of people, well, not lots of people, a few people disagree with me. Most people would agree with me. All right pe thinking people, of course, agree with me, but I want to, to, to mention that I'm not everyone in the world agrees with me, but think about this. The thing that it is meaningful to talk about changing is something that has no dimensions like the fine structure constant. That is something that it makes sense to talk about how it changes. And now with optical clocks that use different kinds of transitions, whose frequency depend upon the fine structure constant in different ways, we can and we are in fact measuring the time dependence of the fine structure constant. And so far it doesn't change at the level of parts in 10 to the 18. So this is amazing and wonderful, but that makes sense. Think about this, what is the fine structure constant? In the SI, it's um, uh, E squared over four pi epsilon naught h bar c. Two years ago, if you had found that the fine structure constant had changed, you would have to have ascribed it to changing either E or H because epsilon naught and, um, uh, and, and C are both defined, but after, the 20th of May, 2019, if the fine structure constant were to change, you would have to ascribe it to a change in epsilon naught, which is no longer a defined quantity. It used to be, but it's no longer. Now, I think that makes it clear that if the date on which you think about this defines which constant changes, you're thinking about it the wrong way. So we should think about uh, only possibility of changes for uh, dimensionless constants like the fine structure constant. And we are free to use things like the speed of light and Planck's constant to define our system of units. Now, is this the best way of doing it? You can well imagine there was a lot of discussion about what the best way of doing it was. And after a great deal of political fighting back and forth, there is politics in the international metrology community. Uh, considering the kind of thing that, that you've raised as a, as a possibility, a very valid uh, and legitimate possibility, uh, they decided that it would be more elegant, more beautiful to define uh, our system of units in this way. But it's a choice. It's a choice that is based on convenience and beauty, as is so often the case in physics. Thanks. I've, I've seen Maxime raising his hand earlier. Now it disappeared. So is it uh, answered already? Yes, yes, yes. I wanted to ask about the fine structure constant, but Bill, Bill answered it already. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. But of course, it's not just the fine structure constant that we should be thinking about. We should be thinking about things like the ratio of the mass of the electron to the mass of the proton. Any of these 
uh, uh, dimensionless constants are things that are are fair game for uh, for for measurement. So I, as I agree with Bill, please allow me to lead to read a few of the question of answer sections. There are, there are actually comments and questions. So the first one is a comment by Yesha. He says that thanks for this wonderful talk. To form a uniform standard of measurement is interesting, and now it is reformed in the most amazing way. So this is a comment. And now I have um, a question by Albert Galemi. He says, hi, Bill. Sorry if the question is a little a bit silly. I understand that there will be always, that there always will be a manner to connect all the SR units to a certain physical constant, except for one, which now is time. Why does time deserve such an honor? Is it because <laughs> the SR unit whose previous definition is able to be measured in a more precise way? What would happen if any uh, another physical SI unit can be measured with more precision than time currently? Should SI units be redefined? Yeah, well, so this is a, a question that's very broad. It's a wonderful question and it, it, it opens up all kinds of, of ideas. So let me try to address a few of them. <clears throat> First of all, it's true. Time has, has the, the, the special place of being the most accurately realized uh, quantity. At the same time, it has this special situation of not being connected to a fundamental constant of nature. It's connected to what we believe to be a constant of nature, namely the hyperfine frequency of cesium. We don't think that changes, but we don't know. And so we, we check it against other uh, 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 atomic frequencies that's being done. And we haven't ever found anything. We don't expect to at the level of much better than what we can measure cesium. But why haven't we used this more beautiful way of defining uh, time? One way that we could imagine would be if we defined the Rydberg constant. The Rydberg constant, as is usually uh, presented, has to do with the wavelength of, uh, uh, of, of light in, in uh, an ideal hydrogen atom, but it could easily be described in terms of um, uh, of frequencies. So, and you, you can see the Rydberg uh, constant tabulated in terms of frequency. So we could define the Rydberg constant. The problem is that we would not be able to realize the definition of the second well enough if we defined the Rydberg constant because we have no physical measurement that can turn the definition of the Rydberg constant into a sufficiently accurate frequency. We don't understand the hydrogen atom well enough. You've probably seen all this scandalous stuff about not knowing what the proton radius is. That is one of the reasons why we uh, cannot use a definition of the Rydberg because we don't even understand how to get frequencies because we don't understand the proton radius. You might say, well, let's just go to purely leptonic systems that don't have non-fundamental particles like positronium. Well, as you well know, the problem with positronium is it doesn't live forever. And so the difficulty of making accurate and precise measurements on transition frequencies in positronium is just really hard compared to uh, um, transitions in, in atoms like strontium or, or, or in ytterbium that have lifetimes that are in excess of a second. Uh, it just, uh, uh, from a practical point of view, it just wouldn't work. Now, it might be that sometime in the future, if we get a lot better at doing things, maybe it'll be uh, uh, possible to do this. Maybe by looking at transitions between Rydberg states, we can eliminate the things that we don't understand about the nucleus of atoms. The trouble is that those frequencies are microwave frequencies and uh, they're subject to shifts uh, due to say black body radiation. There's all kinds of things that might be problems. So I'm not gonna say we will never be able to define the second by defining 
something like the Rydberg constant, but it doesn't look very promising right now. But you also raise the issue that there might be something else that will come up that we could do better, and we will always be open to that. But I'm expecting that at least within my lifetime, but of course that's not much longer, <laughs> Uh, that that we will we will certainly redefine the second at least once, uh, maybe twice. Uh, but we will do it by finding a transition that is really good. So I'm expecting that within the next decade, we're going to redefine the second in terms of an optical frequency standard. Uh, I don't know which one, and that's what needs to be figured out within the next decade. And maybe after that, we will have a nuclear transition. Uh, but there's a lot that we have to learn before a nuclear transition is going to be uh, useful as a time standard. We have to uh, identify the nuclear transition. We have to measure the frequency of gamma rays. Uh, uh, all this is doable. And I hope that it happens within my lifetime, but I'm not tremendously confident in that, but there's gonna be some wonderful changes. Okay, thanks. So I read another comment or question and then we go to the raised hands. So there's an anonymous uh, participant who is asking a practical question in the sense that the meter is defined as the length traveled by light in vacuum. However, that depends on how well we can generate a vacuum. <laughs> is this a potential issue? Could we ever feasibly obtain a perfect vacuum? Okay, well, let me sort of, now what I'm trying to do is to do a back of the envelope calculation in my head. So atmospheric pressure produces a, an index or a fraction change, which if I'm remembering correctly, is about a part in a thousand. Now, uh, the limitations on measuring length due to diffraction effects, which is the thing that limits uh, the measurement of length today, if I'm remembering correctly, I'm not a length metrologist, but I think the limitations are on the order of a part in 10 to the 12. Don't take this as, as gospel truth, because as I said, I'm not a length metrologist. That means in order to be at a part in 10 to the 12, we need to have our vacuum be a part in 10 to the nine of, uh, of atmosphere. Now, to use a non-SI term, which I'm forbidden to use as a, an employee of NIST, that would be approximately 10 to the minus 6 Tor. That is not a very challenging vacuum. So my back of the envelope calculation in my head tells me that it's not a problem achieving a good enough vacuum so that other things will limit the realization of the meter. Well, that's a good question. So you do have to have a decent vacuum, but not a heroic vacuum. In, 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 as an SI guy, this is of course in hectopascal. As we yes. <laughs> and, and of course, as, as many of us know, we are at the level of being almost 10 orders of magnitude better in the best vacuum we can generate in the lab. So there's a long way to go. So Bill is absolutely right in this. Now, let me give the word to Kevin Wright. Um, you raised his, your hand and have a question. Hi, Bill. I was uh, wondering about something you didn't mention during this talk, which I know you've uh, waited on uh, a few times in the past few years, which is the status of angle in the SI. I, I oh, have yes. the impression you're not very happy with the current way that uh, it is treated within the current framework. I was wondering if you could say a few words on what you would like to see happen, if there's anything actually happening in that front. Yes. Well, um, okay. So here's the problem. Since the SI was created officially in 1960, people have been struggling with how to fit angles into the SI. At, in 1960, the radian was put forth as a supplementary unit. In other words, it was neither a base unit nor a, a unit derived from the base units. It was something of itself because people didn't know quite what to do with it. Some years later, they redefined it to be a what they called a coherent um, derived unit, because they said it's the ratio of the arc length divided by the radius. And so that's meters divided by meters, so it has no dimensions. So it's a dimensionless unit. But if you think about that, that's just wrong. Because how do we typically measure angles? Well, I mean, when we were in grade school, we measured angles with a protractor. The protractor was not a device that measured the length of an arc. Uh, 
and divided it by the length of a radius, it was something that measured how far it was between two lines in angle. That is, angle is a separate thing. It's a, it's, it's a physical quantity that is separate from length. We could have defined angle easily uh, in terms of the area swept out uh, rather than, than length. And then it wouldn't have units of, uh, of meter over meter. It would have uh, units of meter squared over meter squared or something like that. And uh, so, so you can just see that, that, that it's not quite right. And so having this dimensionless uh, feature for radians also causes problems because if it's dimensionless, then you can just drop it. Uh, so if you talk about frequencies in radians per second, then the units of that is seconds to the minus one. But what about if the if the frequency is in hertz? Well, it's hertz is also seconds to the minus one, but we know they're not the same thing because the one is radians per second and the other is cycles per second, where a cycle is two pi radians. So this difficulty has caused discussions for decades. And what I want to see is to have angle be treated on an equal footing with other physical quantities, with the idea that one must carry the units of angle throughout any reporting of measurements and any calculations that you do. And only at the very end, and only in very certain circumstances, are you allowed to drop them and never when you express a frequency. In other words, you should never express a periodic phenomenon as being per second. It always has to be radians per second or revolutions per second or degrees per second or some unit. Now degrees of course are not part of the SI, but uh, some clear unit because the failure to do that has resulted in people publishing mistakes. And uh, uh, what we're trying to do is to create a system of units that makes things easy and makes things unlikely to be misunderstood. There's another problem. Today, we need machine readable ways of expressing measurements because more and more, we're going to have computers read papers and compile the results. And if we rely on human judgment to decide when we include radians and when we don't, that's going to make problems for the machines. Now, maybe artificial intelligence will fix that problem, but we're not there yet. And so we need to be very careful how we do things that are causing problems for machines, and they are. So that's my rant about radians. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Okay, so I would like to um, use the occasion that I don't see any urgent and direct questions. Uh, yes, yeah. may, may I ask a question? Ah, Michael, good yes. to see you. And, and, and to see you. Now, now uh, uh, to, concerning angle, mm. what becomes of statements that we meet and encounter with geometric phases that <laughs> yeah. a, certain, a certain phase, a certain angle, equals the solid angle of something else. Now, if angle has dimensions, you would be saying that something equals something squared, which sounds wrong. So how do you, to, okay. pay, well, to, okay. to, avoid, to avoid a pun, how to square that circle? <laughs> okay, so I guess part of the answer is I'm not entirely sure. I mean, it certainly is true. If one was to do something like measure, shall I call it a berry phase? <laughs> what you that, like? Mm. <laughs> that there would be a solid angle traced out by some uh, mm. vector in some space, and that would lead to a phase. Uh, I'm not sure that that represents a problem in the sense that uh, sometimes we find that that some physical quantity implies some other physical quantity that has a different um, a different dimension. Mm -hmm. So so you've asked a question that I haven't thought about. And so the answer is probably not going to be particularly intelligent. Uh, there's another way in which we have had to deal with this problem of of uh, having something equal to its square. Let's say we do an expansion of uh, a trig function. Uh, 
this will be a series mm. of angles, mm. the angle and its square and its, uh, yeah. uh, and if we do that, it doesn't seem to make sense because if each of those things had mm. uh, dimensions, we would have the sum of things that had different dimensions, which is adding apples and oranges. So um, the answer to that is that we must always understand that the argument of a trig function is the numerical value of the physical quantity when expressed in radians. Every physical quantity is a numerical value, a pure number, times a unit. So an angle is one radian. One is the, the, the pure number and radian is the unit. The uh, um, uh, uh, things you know here in front of me is um, uh, 50 grams. So 50 is the pure number, grams is the, is the unit. Every physical quantity, and I emphasize physical quantity, should be a, a number times a unit. When we express trig functions, we take just the number and insert it into the trig function. That's not the only way to understand it, mm. but I think it's the most straightforward way to understand it. I'm afraid it doesn't really answer your question. And so we have a working group, a small working group at NIST, which meets uh, about every week to work on this problem. I'm gonna bring up what you've said about um, uh, uh, having a phase angle that results from a solid angle. I'm gonna bring that up and we're gonna discuss it. Um, well, it. Yes, I hope you do because actually this came up in the 1980s when geometric phases began to be fashionable. Uh, one of my colleagues asked me the question and uh, you know, it's a long time. So, of course, we'll be happy to have your insights if you've been thinking about it for the last 40 years. <laughs> you probably have a more intelligent view of it than we do. Uh, the other thing I should say is that angle is angle. It doesn't matter whether it's a physical plane angle or mm -hmm. a phase angle. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. And I'm afraid that a lot of people want to put these things in different categories. Another thing that people want to put in different categories, so I might as well be open, People talk about frequencies and angular frequencies, and they're all frequencies. Those different names seem to be connected to whether uh, you express it in radians per second or in, in hertz, but they all have to do with frequencies. And I don't care whether something is rotating, so it's a plane angle per mm. unit time, or whether something is oscillating, like an electromagnetic wave, it's still a frequency. And I think that giving different names to these things has caused nothing but mischief. Thank you. You're most welcome. <laughs> and we'll be in touch. <laughs> Good. So now let me start again. I will not stop the discussion because Bill will be available for uh, some more time. A few more minutes. <laughs> yeah, but I would like to structure um, this uh, session because um, I would like to call it for the official end of the session to be able for people to leave. But I also mm. would like to, to use this uh, point to thank Bill and to thank all the speakers of this afternoon session. Um, and I'd be very excited that we have this great program for finishing up the first half of our electronics meeting. So thanks to, to Maxine, thanks to Juan, to Philip, and to Bill for the wonderful presentation. And for everybody who has some other obligations, um, I wish you a great weekend and uh, we are looking forward to seeing you again on Monday for the second part of our Atomtronics meeting. And uh, I uh, call this uh, session closed, but we're gonna continue discussing as long as people are available and Bill said he has a few minutes available. So thanks everybody for their contribution today and thanks for the lively discussions of today. <laughs>